This episode of Serverless Chats is sponsored by CBT Nuggets and Lumigo. On this episode, I chat with Julian Wood about how serverless is becoming more extensible. This is Serverless Chats, episode number 101. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Daly, and this is Serverless Chats. Today, I'm joined by Julian Wood. Hey, Julian, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I am super excited to have you here. Um, I have uh, been following your work for a very long time and, of course, uh, you know, big fan of AWS. Um, so you are a serverless developer advocate at AWS, um, and I'd love it if you could just tell the listeners a little bit about your background so they get to know you a bit, and then also you know, sort of what your role is at AWS. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I'm Julian Wood. I'm based in London. Um, but yeah, please don't let my accent fool you. I'm actually originally from South Africa. So the language purists, purists aren't scratching their heads anymore. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I work within the serverless team uh, at AWS and hopefully do a number of things. First of all, explain what we're up to and, you know, how our sort of serverless things work. And sort of, I like to sometimes say a bit cheekily, you know, basically help the world fall in love with serverless as I have. And then also from the other side is to be a proxy and sort of be the voice of builders and developers and whoever's building serverless applications and be their voices internally so you can also keep us on our toes uh, to help to help build the things that will brighten your days. And just before I, you know, I worked for many, too many years probably as an infrastructure uh, racker stacker, architect and manager, you know, I worked in global enterprises, babysitting their Windows and Linux servers and you know, running virtualization and doing all the operations kind of stuff uh, to support that. But, you know, I was always thinking there's a better way to do this. And, you know, we weren't doing the best for the developers and internal customers. And so when this, you know, in inverted commas, uh, serverless way of uh, things started to appear, I, d I just knew that this was going to be the future. And, you know, I could happily leave the server side to much better and cleverer people than me. And then, you know, so by some weird auspicious alignment of the stars, a while later, I managed to get my current dream job uh, talking about serverless and talking to you. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, I think a lot of serverless people or people who are, love serverless are recovering um, ops and uh, yep. infrastructure, you know, infrastructure people that were doing racking and stacking. Because I, I, I too am also recovering from that, and I still have nightmares. Um, I, I thought that was interesting too. How you mentioned though, uh, you know, developer advocacy. Um, you know, it's funny you work for a specific company, AWS, obviously, but you know, even developer advocacy in general. Um, you know, who is that for? Who are you advocating for? Are you advocating for the developers to use the service from the company, or are you develop? Uh, are you advocating for the developers so that the company can provide the services that they actually need? So. Um, um, interesting balance there. Yeah, it, it's true. And I mean, I mean, the honest answer is we don't have great terms uh, for this kind of role. But um, yeah, I, I think primarily we are advocating for the people who are developing the applications and, you know, on the outside. Um, and to advocate for them means we've got to build the right stuff for them and, you know, get their voices internally. And there are many ways of doing that. And, you know, uh, some people raise uh, support requests and other kind of things. But I mean, sometimes some of our great ideas come from, you know, trawling Twitter or, yes, I know, right. even Hacker News or that kind of thing. Um, but also we try to then, you know, we, we may get responses from 10 different people about something and that will formulate something in our brain and we'll chat with other kind of people. And that sort of starts a uh, starts a thing. It's not just necessarily each time, you know, some good idea in Twitter comes in, you know, it gets mashed into some big, <laughs> some big serverless database that we all, right. all, all pick off. But it's, with, you know, part of our job is to be out there and try and think and be developed developers in whatever backgrounds we come from. And I mean, I'm not a right. pure software developer where I've come from. And I come, I suppose, from infrastructure, but, you know, maybe you'd call that a bit of systems engineering. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I try and bring that background to, um, yeah, to try and give input in, on whatever we're doing. Hopefully the right, right stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think part of the job, too, is, is just getting... Um, you know, getting the information out there and getting the examples out there and, and trying yeah. to, you know, uh, create those best practices or at least surface those best practices and uh, encourage the community to, to do a lot of that work and to, and to follow that. Um, and you've done a lot of work with that, obviously, writing for the AWS blog. I know you have a series um, on um, the serverless lens and the uh, well-architected framework, and we can talk about that in a little while. Um, but I, I really want to talk to you about 
I, I guess just the expansion of serverless, um, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. I mean, it was very narrowly focused, probably, you know, when it first came out. Lambda was like, you know, fast is a whole new concept for a lot of people, and um, and and then as it's progressed, and we've gotten more APIs and more services and things that it can integrate with, and uh, it just becomes, you know, complex and complicated, and um, and and that that's a good thing, but also maybe a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that AWS has done, and I think this is clearly in reaction to you know, the developers needing it um, is the ability to extend what you can do with a, you know, with a Lambda function, right? I mean, the idea of just putting your code in there and then boom, that's it. That's all you have to do. That's great. But what if you do need access to lifecycle hooks or what if you do want to, you know, manipulate the underlying runtime or something like that? Um, and, and AWS, I think, has done a great job with that. So um, so maybe we can start there. So just yeah. about the extensibility of Lambda in general, um, one of the new things that was launched recently was, and recently, I don't know, what was it, seven months ago at this point? I'm not oh. even sure. Um, but uh, was launched fairly recently, let's say that, is Lambda extensions and a couple of different flavors of that as well. Could you yeah. kind of just give the users an over or the users, wow, um, the listeners an <laughs> overview of what we're of what I Lambda can, extensions are? I can hear the ops background coming in talking right. about the user, <laughs> talking about our users. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, from the get-go, serverless was always a terrible term because, you know, why on earth right. would you why on earth would you um, name something for what it isn't? I mean, you know, I remember talking to DBAs talking about NoSQL and they go, well, if it's not SQL, then what is it? You know, so right. we, we're terrible at that serverless as well. And yeah, Lambda was very constrained when it came out. You know, Lambda was never built being a serverless thing. It just sort of, that that's what was the outcome. You know, sometimes we focus right. too much on the tools rather than the outcome. And, you know, the story is S3 just turning 15. And, you know, the genesis of Lambda was being an event trigger for S3. And people thought you'd upload something to S3, fire off a Lambda function. How cool is that? And then obviously the clever clogs at the time were like, well, hang on, let's not just do this for S3. Let's do this for a whole bunch of kind of things. And so Lambda was, you know, was born out of that as that got that great history, which has, you know, created an arc sort of into the present and into the future, which uh, I know we're also going to get on about, you know, the power of, of event-driven applications. Right. But the power of Lambda has always been its, its simplicity and removing that operational burden and that heavy, heavy lifting. But, you know, sometimes that line, you know, is a bit of a gray area. And they're, they're people who can be purists about serverless and can be purists about FAS and say, you know, everything needs to be ephemeral. You can't, uh, you know, Lambda functions can't extend to anything else. There shouldn't be any state, shouldn't be any storage, shouldn't be any, all, all this kind of thing. And, you know, I think both of us can agree. Well, I don't want to speak for you, but I think both of us will agree that in some sense, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, we live in the real world and, right. you know, there's other stuff that needs to, that, that needs to connect to. And we, we're not here about, about building purist kind of stuff. So Lambda extensions is a, a new way basically to integrate Lambda with your favorite tools. And that's the sort of headline thing uh, we, we like to talk about. And the big idea is to open up Lambda to more effectively work mainly with partners, but also your own tools if you want to write them, and right. to sort of have deeper hooks into the into the Lambda lifecycle. And you know, the partners are awesome and they do a whole bunch of stuff for serverless. Um, and you know, plus plus customers also have connections to on-prem stuff or EC2 stuff or containers, all kind of things. And you know, how can we make the tools more seamless in a way? How can we have a common set of tools, maybe that you even use on-prem or in the cloud or containers or whatever? You know, why does Lambda have to be unique or different or or, or, or that kind of thing? And extensions is sort of one of the starts of that is to be able to use these kind of tools and get more um, more out of Lambda. So I mean, just the kind of tools that we've already got on board is things like Splunk and. App Dynamics and right. Lumigo, Epsigon, HashiCorp, um, Honeycomb, CoreLogix, Dynatrace. Oh, I can't think. Uh, Thundra and Sumo Logic, <laughs> Checkpoint. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, of no, any part right, no, that's who right. I've forgotten. Shout you. them out. Shout them out. No, I, actually, I mean, just uh, not to interrupt you here, but no, I please. think that's great. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I like about the way that AWS deals with partners is that, uh, I mean, I think AWS knows they can't solve all these problems on their own. I mean, maybe they could, right? But they would be their own way of solving the problems. And there's other people who are solving these problems differently and giving you the ability to extend your Lambda functions into those partners, um, you know, is again, is a huge win for not only the partners because it creates that ecosystem for them, but also for AWS because it makes the product itself more, value, uh, yeah, more well, valuable. Well, never mind the big win for customers because ultimately they're the one who right. then gets a you know common deployment tool or a common uh, observability tool or you know like a HashiCorp Vault that you can you know manage secrets in the Lambda function from HashiCorp Vault. I mean that's super cool. Right. Uh, I mean we, we've got our own you know they're also AWS services who are picking this up because that's easy for them to do stuff. <clears throat> so if anybody's used Lambda Insights or even seen 
Lambda Insights in the console. Uh, it's somewhere in the monitoring thing, and you just tick so, uh, click something over, and you get this uh, tool which can pull uh, stuff that you can't normally get from a Lambda function. So mm. things like CPU time and network throughput, which you couldn't normally get. But actually, under the hoods, Lambda Insights is using um, is using Lambda extensions, and you can right. see that if you look, at it automatically adds a Lambda layer. And job done. So anyway, this is how a lot of the tools work. That a, um, a layer is just added to a lambda function, and off you go. The tool can can do its work. So also, there's a very much a simplicity angle on this. That in a lot of cases you don't have to do anything. Um, you configure some of the extensions via environment variables. So that's cool. You may just have an API key or a you know a log retention value or something like that. I don't know any kind of example that. But you just right. configure that as a normal uh, lambda environment variable. Add this partner uh, extension, which is just a Lambda layer, and off you go. Super simple. All right. So explain extensions exactly, because I think that that's one of those things. Because now we have Lambda layers, um, and we have Lambda extensions, and there's also like the runtime API, and then something else. I mean, even I, even I'm not a hundred percent sure what all of the you know the naming conventions. I'm pretty sure I know what they do, but um, yeah, maybe enough. we could say the names and say exactly what yeah. they do as well. Well, you get an API, I get an API, everybody gets an API. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So Lambda layers, let's just start because that's, although it's not related to extensions, it's how extensions are delivered to zip archive functions. And Lambda layers is, <clears throat> is just another way to add code to a Lambda function. Or, or not even code, it can be a dependency. It's just a, a way that you could, and it's cool because they are shareable. So you have right. some dependencies or you have a library or an SDK or uh, you know uh, some training data for something. It's, a Lambda layer just uh, allows you to add some, um, uh, some bits and bobs to your Lambda function. That's a horrible explanation. There's another word I was thinking of, because <laughs> I don't want to use the word code because it's not necessarily code, but it's dependencies or whatever. Right. It's just another way of adding something. I'll wake up in a cold sweat tonight thinking of the word I was I was thinking of. <laughs> but anyway. So but Lambda extensions uh, introduces a whole new companion API. So the runtime API is the little bit of code that allows your function to talk to the Lambda service. So when an event comes in, uh, this is from the outside. You know, this could be via API Gateway or via the Lambda API or where, where else, Event Bridge or Step Functions or wherever. When you then tra uh, transport that that arrives in the Lambda service as an HTTP call, and Lambda transposes that into an event and sends that on to the Lambda function, and it's that API that that manages that. And just as a sidebar, what I find the cool on a sort of geeky technical thing is that actually, actually API sits within the execution environment. <clears throat> mm. People are like, oh, that's weird. Why would your Lambda API sit within the execution environment, basically within the bubble that contains your function, rather than it on the Lambda service? And the cool answer for that is it's actually for a, a security mechanism. Like mm. your function can then only ever talk to the Lambda runtime API, which is in that secure execution environment. And so our security can be a lot stronger because we know that no function code can ever talk directly out of the Lambda service, uh, out of your function to into the Lambda service. It's all got to talk locally. And then the Lambda service gets that response from the runtime API and you know sends it back to the caller or whatever. Anyway, sidebar, mm. thought that was ner <laughs> nerdy and interesting. So what we've now done is we've released a new extensions API. So the extensions API is another API that an extension can use to get um, information from Lambda. And there are two different types of extensions, just briefly, internal and external extensions. Now, internal extensions run within the runtime process, so that it's just basically another thread. So you can use this for Python or Java or something, and say, uh, you know, when my Python when the Python runtime starts, let's start it with another parameter and also run this jar file that may do some observability or logging or tracing or you know finding out how how long the modules take to launch, for example. I know right. there's an example for that uh, for Python. So that's <clears throat> that, that's one way of doing uh, um, um, extensions. So it's internal extensions. They're two different flavors, but you know I'll, I'll send you a link. I'll provide a link to the blog post before we go too far down the rabbit hole on that. <laughs> and then the other part of extensions are external extensions, and this is a, a cool part because they actually run as completely separate processes, but still within that secure bubble, that secure uh, execution environment that Lambda runs in. <clears throat> and this gives you some uh, some superpowers, if you want. Because first of all, an extension can run in any language because it's a separate process. 
So if you've got a node function, you could run an extension in other kind of processes, uh, in other kind of languages. Now, what we do recommend is you do run your extension in a compiled binary, just because you've got to provide the runtime that the extension's got to run in anyway. So as a compiled binary, it's super easy and super useful. So something like Go, a lot of people are doing because you write a single extension in Go, and then you can use it for, uh, you know, on your node functions, your Java functions, right. your PowerShell functions, whatever. So that's a really good, um, simple way that you can have the portability. But now, what are these? Uh, what can these extensions do? Well, the extensions basically register with the extensions API, and then they say to Lambda, Lambda, I want to know about what happens when my functions invoke. So mm -hmm. the extension can start up. Maybe it's got some initialization code. Maybe it needs to connect to a database or log into an observability platform or pull down a secret order. That it can do. It's got its own init that can happen. And then it's basically ready to go before the, the, the function invokes. And then when, uh, when the extension then registers and says, I want to know when the function invokes and when it shuts down. Cool. And that's just something it registers with the API. Then what happens is when a function invoke comes in, it uh, tells the runtime API, Hello, you now have an event, sends it off to the Lambda function, which the runtime uh, manages. But also, uh, um, extension or extensions, multiple ones, here's information about that event. And so it can tell you the, the time it's going to run and has some metadata about that, uh, uh, that event. So it doesn't have the actual um, event data itself, but it's, sort of, it's like the sort of Lambda context a version of that that it's going to send to the extension. And so the extension can use that to do various things. It can start collecting telemetry data. It can auto-instrument auto some of your code. It could be managing a secret as a separate process that it is going to cache uh, uh, in the background. For example, we've got one with uh, with uh, AppConfig, which is really cool. Uh, so AppConfig is a service where you manage uh, uh, parameters external to your Lambda function. Now, each time your Lambda function warm invokes, if you've got to do an external API call to manage to retrieve that, well, you know, that's going to be a little efficient. First of all, you're going to pay for it and it's going to take some time. So how about when the Lambda function um, runs and the extension can run before the Lambda function, why don't we just cache that uh, locally? And then when your Lambda function runs, it just makes a local HTTP call to the extension to retrieve that value, which is going to be super quick. And some uh, extensions are super clever because they're their own process. They will go, well, my value is for 30 minutes and every 30 minutes, if I haven't been run, I will then, uh, I will then re uh, up update the value from that. So right. that, that, that's useful. Um, extensions can then also, when the runtime, sorry, let me back up. When the runtime is finished, it sends its response back to the runtime API and extensions, when they're done doing, so the runtime can send it back and the extension can carry on processing saying, Oh, I've got, I've got the information about this. I know that this Lambda function has done X, Y, Z. So let me, uh, do, you know, do some telemetry. Let me maybe, you know, if I'm writing logs, I could write a log to S3 or to Kinesis or whatever. Do, do some kind of thing after the actual function invocation has happened. And then when it says it's ready, it says, um, hello, Mr. Ex uh, Extensions API. I'm calling, uh, I'm telling you I'm done. And then it's gone. And then Lambda freezes the execution environment, including uh, the runtime and the extensions until another invocation happens. And the cycle then all happens. And then the last little bit that happens is instead of an invoke coming in, uh, we've extended the uh, Lambda lifecycle. So uh, when the environment is going to be shut down, the extension can receive the shutdown and actually do some stuff and say, OK, well, I was connected to my observability platform. So let me close that connection. I've got some extra logs to flush out. Um, I've got whatever else I need to do and just be able to cleanly shut down the, that extra process that is running in parallel to the Lambda function. All right. So that was well, that a lot was a, of words. That was a lot, um, and I bet you that would be um, that'd be great conversation for like a you know for a dinner party. Um, <laughs> really, <laughs> with kick some things off. Nerds. Um, now the good news is is that uh, first of all, thank you for that though. I mean that's super technical and super in depth, and and for anyone listening who you did kind of lost I, I their way. <laughs> <laughs> it's something, yes, but something that is really important to remember is that you likely don't have to write these yourself, right? There are exactly. you, all those companies you mentioned earlier, all those partners, um, they've already done this work. They've already figured this out and they're providing you access to, the, to their tools via, via this that allows you to build things. So if you exactly. want to build an extension um, you and you want to you know, integrate your product with Lambda or so forth, um, then you know maybe go back and, and listen to this at half speed. But um, for those of you who just want to take advantage of it because of the, the great functionality, um, a lot of these companies have already done that for you. Correct. And that's the sort of easiness thing of just adding the Lambda layer or including in a, in a container image. And yeah, you don't have to worry any, any about that. <clears throat> but behind the scenes, there's a, you know, some really cool functionality that 
we're literally opening up how Lambda operates and allowing you to impact, um, you know, when a when a function responds. All right. All right. So let me ask a, a, a another uh, maybe a, an overly technical question. Um, I have heard, um, and I haven't experienced this, but that when it runs the life cycle that ends the Lambda function, um, does it? N I've heard something like it doesn't send the information right away, or, right? You have to wait for that Lambda to expire or something like that. Uh, well, yes. For now about to change. So currently extensions okay. is actually in preview. And um, right, right. that's not because it's in beta or anything like that, but it's because we spoke to the partners and we didn't want to you know, dump extensions on the world and all the partners had to come out with their uh, extensions on day one and then try right. and figure out our customers are gonna use them and everything. So what, I, what we really did, which I think in this case works out really well is we, you know, we worked with the partners and said, well, let's release this in preview mode and then give you, you everybody a whole bunch of months to work out what's the best use cases, you know, yeah. how, how can we best use this? And, uh, you know, some partners have said, oh, amazing, we're ready to go. And some partners have said, oh, we, it wasn't quite what we thought. Maybe we're going to wait a bit or we're going to do something differently or we've got some cool ideas. Just you know, give us time. And so that, that's yeah. what this time has been. The one other thing that, uh, that has happened is we've actually added some performance enhancements during it. So, yes, currently during the preview, um, the runtime and all extensions need to finish before we give you your uh, response back to your Lambda function. So if you're in an asynchronous mode, you don't really care, but obviously if you're in a synchronous mode behind an API, yeah, that's you don't really want that. Right. But when extensions goes GA, which isn't going to isn't going to be long, um, then that is no longer the case. So basically, what will happen is the the runtime will respond, and the the result goes directly back to whoever's calling that, maybe your API gateway, and the extensions can carry long uh, carry on um, partly asynchronously in the background. Yeah. Awesome. All right. And I know that it is that, you know, the plan is to go GA soon. I'm not yeah. sure when around when this episode comes out that that will be, but, but soon. So that's good to yeah. know that that is, um, and in fact, when, um, when we go GA, that, um, that performance enhancement is part of the GA. So when it goes awesome. GA, then, you know, it's not something else you need to wait for. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to take a minute to thank our sponsor, CBT Nuggets. If you're an IT professional or a developer like me, you know how important it is to constantly be learning new skills to keep up with the latest trends. Now, sometimes a blog post or a YouTube tutorial can get you started, but if you really want to upskill, nothing compares to professional training from experts you can trust. With CBT Nuggets, I have access to more than 400 courses and 4,000 hours of professional training. And with a 100% in-house training team, they add 40 hours of new training every week. Their courses feature topics ranging from building serverless apps with Lambda and DynamoDB to certification-focused training for AWS, Microsoft, Linux, and more. CBT Nuggets also offers virtual labs so you can practice your new skills as you're learning them. They also have accountability coaching, which lets you talk to a real person to create a customized learning plan to set goals and keep you accountable. So whether you're a developer looking to sharpen your skills or a team looking to level up together, you can try CBT Nuggets for free for seven days thanks to their free trial offer. Just visit cbtnuggets.com serverless and sign up to get started. All right, so let's move on to another bit of, I don't know if this is, um, you know, extensibility of the actual product itself, or more so, I think, ex extensibility of maybe the workflow that you use to uh, deploy to Lambda and deploy your serverless applications, um, and that's container image support. So what's, what's I mean, we've discussed it a lot. I think people kind of have an idea, but just give me your quick overview of, of, of what that is to set some context here. Yeah, sure. So, well, container image support in a simple sort of headline thing is to be able to build and package your functions as a container image. So you basically build a function uh, using a Docker file. So before, if you use a zip function, but you know a lot of people use serverless framework or SAM or whatever, that's all abstracted away from you. But it's actually creating a zip file and uploading it to Lambda right. or, or S3. So with container image support, you use a Docker file to to build your Lambda function. That that's the headline of of what's happening. Right, and and so the idea of creating, um, and this is also again you mentioned packaging, right? I mean that is the big thing here. This is a packaging format. You're not actually running the container in a lambda function. Correct. So, yeah, let me let's maybe think because I mean containers in inverted commas again for people who are on the audio right. <laughs> is you know, what does it even be, mean? Yeah, exactly, and can be quite an overloaded terms, and you know definitely causes some confusion. And you know I sort of. 
think maybe there's sort of four things that are in the container world. You know, one containers is an isolation mechanism. So on Linux, this is you know C group, sec comp, you know, other bits and pieces that can be used to isolate isolate processes or you know maybe groups of processes. And then the second one containers is the packaging mechanism. You know, this is what uh, Docker really popularized. And this is about taking some code and the dependencies needed to run the code and then packaging them all up together along, you know, maybe with some metadata to describe it. And then, you know, uh, three is containers is also a design philosophy. You know, this is the idea if we can package and isolate software, it's easier to run. Maybe smaller pieces of software is easy to reason about and, you know, uh, manage independently. So I, I don't want to necessarily use microservices, but, you know, there's some component of, of that with right. there. And, you know, the emphasis here is on software rather than services and, you know, standardized tooling to simplify your ops. And then the fourth thing is containers as an ecosystem. And, you know, this is where all the products, tools, know-how, know, uh, you know, all the actual um, things to how to do containers. And I mean, these right. are certainly useful, but I wouldn't say they're anything about the other kind of things. But what right. is cool and worth appreciating is how maybe independent these things are. So when I spoke about containers as isolation, well, we could actually replace containers as isolation with uh, micro VMs, uh, such as we do with uh, Firecracker, and there's no real change in the operational uh, properties. Mm. So, you know, one if we think, you know, what, what are we doing with containers and why, you know, one of those is, is in a way ticked off with Lambda. Lambda does have secure isolation. Um, and containers as a packaging format, well, I mean, you could replace it with uh, static linking and, you know, then maybe won't, won't really be a change, but there, there's less convenience. Um, and the design philosophy, you know, that could really be applicable if we're talking microservices, you know, you could have instances and certainly functions, but containers are all, all, all the same kind of thing. So right. if we talk about the packaging of Lambda functions, it's really for people who are more familiar with containers, you know, why does Lambda have to be different? You've got, why does Lambda have to be a snowflake in a way that you have to manage differently? And, mm. you know, if you are packaging dependencies and you're doing NPM or pip install and you're used to building Docker files, well, why can't we just do that for Lambda at the same things? And, you know, right. we've got some other things that come with that, you know, larger function sizes up to 10 gig, uh, which uh, which is enabled with some of this technology. So it's a packaging format, but on the back end, there's a whole bunch of different stuff which has to be uh, has to be done to uh, to allow this. And, you know, the benefits right. are, you know, use your tooling. You've got your CI CD pipelines already for containers. Uh, well, you know, you can use that. Yeah, yeah, and I and I actually like that that idea too. And when I was first when, when I first heard of it, I was like, I have nothing against containers. The containers yeah. are great. Um, but when I was thinking about it, I'm like, what, wait, container? No, what? What's happening here? We're 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 losing something. Um, yeah. But I I will say, you know, like when Lambda Layers came out, which was I think maybe 2019 or something like that, um, maybe 2018. Um, it, the the idea of it made a lot of sense, being able to kind of you know supplement, add you know additional dependencies or code or whatever. Um, but it always just it just seemed awkward and some of the publishing for it was a little bit um awkward like the you know the versioning was uh you know all used yeah. like a numbered versioning instead of like semantic versioning and things like that and then you had to share it to multiple places and if you published it as a sar app then you got global distribution anyways it was a little bit um it was a little bit hard to use. Um, and then, and, and so when you're trying to package large dependencies and put those in a layer and then combine them with a Lambda function, the other problem you had was you still had a maximum um, size that you could use yeah. um, for, for those when those were combined. Um, so I like this idea of saying like, look, I, I like to just kind of create this little isolate, like you said, um, put my dependencies in there, whether that's PyCharm or some other thing that is a big dependency that maybe I don't want to install um, you know, directly uh, in, a, in a Lambda layer or I don't want to do directly my Lambda function, but you do that together, and then that whole process just is a lot easier. And then you can actually run those containers. Um, you could run those locally and test those if you wanted to. Correct. So that's also one of the you know sort of superpowers of this, and that's when I was talking about uh, you know just being able to package them up. Well, that now enables a whole bunch of extra kind of stuff. So yes, the first of all <clears throat> is you can then use those uh, container images that you've created as your local testing. And I know you know we all. It's silly for anyone to poo poo lo local testing. And, you know, we do say, like to say, well, you know, bring your testing to the cloud and uh, rather than bringing uh, the cloud to your testing. But mm -hmm. testing locally for unit tests is super great. It's going to be right. super fast. You can, you know, iterate over your Lambda functions. But, you know, we don't want to be mocking all of DynamoDB, all of, you know, building harebrained S3 options locally. So, um, but the cool thing is you've got the same Docker file that you're going to run in Lambda can be the same Docker file to build your function that you can run, uh, that you run locally. And it is literally exactly the same Lambda function that's going to run. And yes, that may be locally, 
But you know, for this, with a bit of a stretch of kind of stuff, you could also run those Lambda functions uh, elsewhere. So even if you need to run it on EC2 instances or ECS or Fargate or some kind of thing, this gives you a lot more opportunities um, mm. to be able to use the same Lambda function, maybe in different way, shapes, or forms, even even if it's is on prem. Now obviously you can't recreate all of lambda because that's uh, you know connected to IAM and it's got huge availability and scalability and latency and all that kind of things, but you can actually run a lambda function in a lot more places. Yeah, which is interesting. Um and then the other thing I had mentioned earlier was the size. So the the now the size of these container or these packages can be much much bigger. Yeah, up to 10 gig. So the um, serverless purists in the back are shouting, what about cold starts? What about cold right. starts? <laughs> That's my next question, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just, I mean, back on uh, uh, zip function archives are also all available. Nothing changes with that Lambda layers, you know, many uh, many people use and love. That's all available. So, th you know, this isn't a, uh, a replacement. It's just a new way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So now we've got um, Lambda functions that can be up to 10 gig in size. Um, surely, surely that's got to be insane for cold starts. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, part, part of what I was talking about earlier of some of the work we've done on the back end uh, to support this is to be able to support these super large package sizes. And the, the high level thing is that we actually cache those um, things really close to where the Lambda la layer is mm. going to be run. Now, if you run the Docker ecosystem, you build your Docker files based on base images. And so this needs to be uh, Linux. Uh, one of the super things with the container image support is you don't have to use Amazon Linux or Amazon Linux 2 for Lambda functions. You could actually now build your Lambda functions also on Ubuntu or Debian or mm. Alpine or whatever else. And so that also gives you a lot more funct uh, functionality and flexibility. You don't need to, you can use the same Linux distribution, you know, maybe across your entire suite, you know, be it on-prem or anywhere else. Right. right. And there are two little components. There's a, an interface client, which you install. It's just another uh, Docker layer. And that's that runtime API shim that talks to the, the runtime API. And then there's a runtime interface emulator. And that's a thing that pretends to be Lambda. So you can, uh, you know, shunt those events between HTTP and JSON. And that's a thing you would use to run locally. So the runtime, runtime interface client means you can, uh, you know, use any Linux uh, distribution add the runtime interface client and you're compatible with Lambda. And then the interface emulator is what you would use for local testing or if you want to you know, spread your wings and run your Lambda functions elsewhere. Right. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, so the other thing I think that containers, you know, container support does um, is that I think it opens up a broader set of, um, uh, of uh, or I guess a, a larger audience of people who are familiar with containerization and how that works, bringing those to Lambda functions. And one of the things that you really don't get when you run you know, when you run a container, I guess, in EC, uh, EC2 or not EC2, I'm sorry, uh, ECS or, or Fargate or something like that, um, without kind of adding another layer on top of it is the eventing aspect of it. I mean, Lambda just is naturally an event-driven, you know, uh, a, yeah. a compute layer, right? And so um, eventing and this idea of event-driven applications and so forth, so forth has just become much more popular and I think much more mainstream. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts? What are you seeing in terms of, you know, especially working with so many customers and, and, and businesses that are using this now? Um, how are you seeing this uh, sort of evolution or adoption of event-driven applications? Yeah, I mean, it's quite funny to think that actually the event-driven application was the genesis of Lambda rather than it being serverless. Um, mm. So, you know, I mentioned earlier about the, you know, starting with S3. Um, yeah, Lambda has, the whole crux of Lambda has been, I respond to an event, you know, via API Gateway or, you know, something on SQS or uh, via the API or anything. And so <clears throat> the whole point, in a way, of Lambda has been this uh, event-driven computing, which I... I think people are starting to sort of understand in a bigger thing than, oh, this is just the way you have to do Lambda. Mm. Because I do think with serverless has a unique challenge where there is a new conceptual learning maybe that you have to go through. And, you know, one of the things that holds uh, back service development is, you know, people are used to a client server and maybe ports and sockets. And even if you're doing right. containers or on-prem or EC, EC2, you know, you're talking IP addresses and load balancers and sockets and firewalls and all, all this kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, you know, when we're building these applications that are going to be composed of multiple services talking together through using APIs and events, um, you know, the events is actually going to be a super part of it. And I know he is 
not for so much longer, but my ultimate boss. But I can blame Jay, Jeff Bezos just a little bit because, <laughs> you know, he did say that if you want to talk via anything, talk via an API. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was 100% right and that was great. But now we're sort of evolving that it doesn't just have to be an API and it doesn't have to be something behind API Gateway or some API that you can run and you can use the sort of power of events, uh, particularly in an asynchronous model uh, to not just be forced again in inverted commas to use APIs, uh, but have far more flexibility of how data and information is going to flow through not maybe not just your application, but your suite of applications or, you know, to and from your partners or, um, or, or where that is. And ultimately, you know, applications are going to be distributed. And, uh, you know, maybe that is connecting to partners that could be SaaS partners, or it's going to be an on-prem component, or maybe things, you know, in, in other kind of places. And, uh, you know, those things need to communicate. And so the way of thinking about events is a is a super powerful way of, of thinking about that. Right. And it's not and it's not necessarily new. I mean, we've been doing web hooks for quite some time and, and that idea of, you know, something is going to happen somewhere and I want to be notified of it is again not a new concept. But yeah. um but I, I think certainly the way that it's evolved with Lambda and the way that other fast products had done eventing and things like that is just those tight integrations and that, you know, just all of the I guess the connective tissue that runs between those things to make sure that the events get delivered and that you can DLQ them and you can do all these other things with retries and stuff like that. Um, is is pretty powerful. So, um, so I know you have. Um, I, I actually just mentioned this on the last episode um, about one of my favorite books. I think that changed my thinking and really got me thinking about how microservices communicate uh, with one another. And that was um, Building Microservices by Sam Newman, um, yeah. which I actually said was sort of like my bible for a couple of years as I yeah. used that. Um, uh, so what are what are some of the other like? I know you have a favorite book on this. Yeah, well, I mean that 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 Building Microservices Sam Newman, and I think there's a part two. I think it's part two, or there's another Another one Hopefully. in the works. I think right. even on O'Reilly's website, you can go and see some preview copies of it. I actually haven't seen that. But yeah, I mean, that that is a great kind of Bible talking. And sometimes we do conflate this microservices things with a whole bunch of stuff. But, you know, if you are talking events, you're talking about separating things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the book recommendation I have is one called Flow Architectures by James mm. Urquhart. And James Urquhart actually works for VMware, but he's written this book, which is looking sort of uh, at the current state and also looking into the future about how does information flow through our applications and mm. between companies and all this kind of thing. And he goes into some of the technology. And when we talk about flow, you know, we are talking about streams and we're talking about events. Uh, so streams would be, let's maybe put some AWS words around it. You know, streams would be something like Kinesis and events right. would be something like EventBridge and topics would be SNS and SQS would be queues and I know we've got all these things and I wish some clever person would create the one flow service <laughs> to rule them all, uh, but we're not there. And they've got also different properties which are uh, um, helpful for different things. And I know confusingly some of them merge, uh, but James's sort of big idea is, you know, in the future, we are going to be able to moving data around uh, between businesses, between applications. So how can we think of that as a flow and what does mm -hmm. that mean for designing applications and and how we handle that? And you know, Lambda is part of it, but even more nicely, I think, is even some of the native integrations where you don't have to have a Lambda function. So if you've right. got you know API Gateway talking to step functions directly, for example, well, that's even better. I mean, you don't have any code to manage, and if it's certainly any code that I've written, um, you probably don't want to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this idea of flow, yeah, Lambda is great for doing some of this moving around, but um, yeah, we are even evolving to be able to flow data around our applications without having to do anything and just wire up some things in a console or, or in a right. terminal. Right. Well, so you mentioned, you know, someone build the, could build the ultimate sort of, um, you know, flow control system or whatever. I, I mean, I honestly think EventBridge is very close to that. Um, and I actually had Mike Deck on the show, I think it was like on yep. episode five. So two years ago, whenever it was, when the show came out, I mean, when, uh, when EventBridge came out um, and uh, we were talking and I sort of made the joke, I'm like, so this is like serverless webhooks, essentially being able, because there was the partner integrations where partners could push events onto um, uh, onto an event bus, which I, they still can do. Yep. Um, but this has evolved, right? Because the issue was always sort of like, I, you know, I would have to subscribe to webhooks. I'd have to build a webhook to get events from a particular company. Um, 
which was great, always worked fine, but you're still maintaining that infrastructure. So EventBridge comes along, it creates these partner integrations, and now you can just push an event on that now your applications, whether it's a Lambda function or other services, you can push them to an SQS queue, you can push them into a Kinesis stream, like all, all these different destinations. Um, you can go ahead and pull that data in and, and that's just there. So you don't have to worry about maintaining that infrastructure. And then um, the the uh, EventBridge team went ahead and released the destination API, I think it's called. Yeah, um, API destinations. And, uh, Event destinations, uh, yeah, event API destinations, right? Where now you can set up these in integrations with other companies, so you don't even have to make the API call yourself anymore. Um, but instead, you get all of the the retries, you get the throttling, you get all that stuff kind of built in. So, um, I mean, it's just really, really interesting where this is going. And actually, I mean, if you want to take a second to tell people about EventBridge API destinations, um, you know, like what that can do, because I think that now sort of creates both sides of that equation for you. It does. And um, I was just thinking over there, you've done a 10 times better job at explaining uh, API destinations than I have. So you, you've nailed, yeah, I mean, you've nailed it on the head. And, it, in, you know, partly it is that kind of simple. And it is just uh, events land up in your event bridge um, and you can just pump events to any arbitrary endpoint. So it doesn't have to be in, AB, uh, in AWS. It can be on-prem. It can be to your Raspberry Pi. It can literally be anywhere. But it's not just about pumping the events over there because, okay, how do we handle failover and how, how do we handle over, over throttling? And so this is part of the extra cool goodies that, that came with API destinations is that you can, um, for instance, if you are sending API, uh, sending events to some external API and you only licensed for a thousand, uh, you know, a thousand invocations, well, not invocations, that would be too lambdaish, but a, a thousand hits on the API, for, you know, every minute. Quotas, or, I think we call quotas, them quotas. something like right. that. That's a much better term. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, some sort of quota. Well, you can just apply that in uh, API destinations, and it will basically, you know, store the store the data uh, in the meantime in EventBridge and fire that off to the API destination. If the API destination is also uh, in that sort of throttle, and if the API destination is down, well, it's going to be able to do some, you know, exponential back off or you know, calm down a little bit. Don't over flood this external API, and then eventually, when the API does come back, it will be able to uh, send those events. So yeah, that does just really give you excellent power rather than maintaining all these individual API endpoints yourself and have to handling the, you know, the avail you're not handling the availability of the endpoint API, but of whatever your code is that needs to talk to that, um, to that destination. Right. And I, and I, I don't want to oversell this to anybody, but no, that, no, also going, adds, <laughs> that also adds the capability of uh, enhanced security because you're not yep. exposing those uh, API keys to your developers or anybody else. They're all baked in and stored within um, the API destinations or within EventBridge. Um, you have the ability, you mentioned this idea of not needing Lambda to maybe talk directly, you know, API gateway to, um, you know, to DynamoDB or to Step Function or something like that. I mean, the cool thing about this is you do have translation capabilities where, or transformation capabilities in EventBridge where you can transform the event. So um, I haven't tried this, but I'm assuming it's possible to say, get an event from Salesforce and then pipe it into Stripe or some other API that you might want to, you might want to pipe it into. So, um, I mean, just that idea of having that centralized bus that can communicate with all these different things. I mean, we're talking about distributed systems here, right? So why is it different sending an event from my microservice A to my microservice B? Why can't I send it from my microservice A to company Y's, you know, microservice B or whatever? Um, and being able to do that in a secure, reliable, um, you know, just with all of that stuff kind of built in for you. Like, I, I think it's amazing. So I love EventBridge. To me, EventBridge is one of those services that rivals Lambda. Like it's as, it's as um, I guess, as uh, important as Lambda is in this whole serverless equation. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just sitting here. I don't actually have to say anything. This is, this is, this is a brilliant interview. And uh, <laughs> Jeremy, you're the expert and you're just uh, like laying down all of the excellent use cases. Yeah. And, and exactly it. I mean, I, I, I like to think we've got a sort of, from a, we've got sort of three interlinked services, which do three different things, but are awesome. Lambda, you know, we love if you need to do some processing or you need to do something that's literally your business logic. Right. I've got EventBridge that can route uh, data from in and out of SaaS partners to any other kind of API. And then you've got step functions that can do some coordination. And they all work together, but you, you know, you've got three different things that really have 
sort of superpowers in terms of the amount of stuff you can do with it. And yeah, start with them. If you land up bumping up against uh, any kind of things that it doesn't work, well, first of all, get in touch and we'll work on that. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but then you can maybe start thinking about, you know, is it containers or uh, EC2 or that kind of thing. But using literally just Lambda, um, step functions and event bridge. Um, okay, yes, maybe you're going to need some queues, topics and APIs and that kind of thing. But I, mean, I was just going to say add DynamoDB in there for oh, yeah. some, from, yeah. for some uh, permanent state. And yeah, I wasn't talking this data state, persistence, right. right? Yeah, you need, but you other than that, state. no, I think I think you nailed it. I, I honestly like I, sometimes you're starting to build applications, and yeah, you're right. You need the you maybe need a queue here, here and there, and things like that. But for the most part, no. I mean, you can build a lot with those three or four services. Yeah, well, I mean, th even think of it what you used to do before uh, with API destinations. Maybe you drop something on a queue. You'd have Lambda pull that from a queue. You have right. uh, Lambda concurrency, which would be set to five per second to then send that to an external API. If it failed going to that API, well, you've got to then dump it to Lambda destinations or to another SQS queue. You've then got yep. something, oh, you know, I'm going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Or just put it on event bridge and you know, right. or <laughs> just have it magically. We talk happen. about re removing serverless infrastructure, you know, not right. normal infrastructure, and just removing even the serverless bits, which is great. Yeah, no, I think that's amazing. Hi everyone, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor Lumigo. We've talked a lot about observability on the podcast, and if you listen to any of those episodes, then you know that it can be difficult to achieve serverless observability with traditional approaches. Though serverless comes with many opportunities and advantages, it also has some unique issues that some tools just aren't able to address, and those issues really need something meant for serverless environments. That's where Lumigo comes in. As a serverless-first monitoring platform, Lumigo lets developers quickly and easily find and fix errors and performance issues, while also giving you an end-to-end -end view of the entire transaction across services and functions. Now, all of the debugging information you need is conveniently in one place, and you're able to set up alerts so that you know what's happening and how it might affect the user experience. Lumigo also knows how to play nice with your existing tool chain, enabling you to send alerts to email, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Ops Genie, and more, and can also create tickets in JIRA straight from the issues page. Now, thanks to their automatic distributed tracing, it only takes four clicks to set up Lumigo, with no manual code changes necessary. Lumigo already has a free plan that lets you track up to 150,000 AWS Lambda invocations a month, but today they're offering Serverless Chats listeners a special promotion. Sign up for a free account at Lomigo.io and enter promo code CHATS500 and your free account limit will go up to half a million monthly invocations. That's Lomigo.io with promo code CHATS500 to try it out today. So we talked about a couple of these different services and we talked about packaging formats and we talked about um, event driven applications and all these other things. And um, a lot of the stuff, even though some of it may be familiar and you could probably equate it or relate it to things that, that developers might already know, there is still a lot of new stuff here. And, uh, and I think, you know, my biggest complaint um, about serverless was not about the capabilities of it. Um, it was the, you know, it was basically the education and the ability to get people to adopt it and understand um, the power behind it. So let's Sounds talk like about that a little bit because what's that? It sounds like my job description. Perfect. Yeah, right. So there you go. Right. That's what you're supposed to be doing, Julian. Why are why you doing it? No, but you are doing it. You are doing it. No, and that's and that's the, the, that's why I want to talk to you about it. So um, you have that series on um, the well architected framework. Um, you know, and we can talk about that. There's there's a um, whole bunch of really good resources on this. Obviously, you're doing videos and in, in conference. Well, you used to be doing conferences. I think you probably still do some of those virtual ones, right? Which are not. Not the same thing. I mean, it Not was quite, uh, it was no. fun seeing you in Cardiff and and uh, where yeah, else? Yeah, Belfast, Belfast, Cardiff and really. Northern Ireland. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah, we've been all over the place together. Yeah, the but anyways, uh, brilliant. Right. Um, so uh, so tell me a little bit about sort of the education process that um, you know that you're trying to do, or maybe even where you sort of see the state of serverless education now, um, and just sort of where it's evolved, where we're getting best practices from, what's out there for people. Um, that's a really long question, but I don't know. Maybe you can distill that down to something usable. No, that, that's that's quite right. I'm, I'm thinking back to my um, extensions explanation, which is a really long answer. So we're doing really long <laughs> stuff, but that's that's fine. But I will, I like to also bring this back to also thinking about the people aspect of IT. And I, mm. you know, there's we talk a lot about the technology, and uh, you know, Lambda is amazing, and S3 is amazing, and all those kind of things. But ultimately, it is still sort of people lashing together these services and building the serverless applications and deciding what you even need to do. And so the education is very much tied with 
of course, having the products and features that do lots of kind of things. And, you know, serverless, there's always this, this um, lever, I suppose, between simplicity and functionality. And, you know, we are adding lots of, you know, knobs and levers and everything to Lambda to make it more feature rich, but we've got to try and keep it simple at the same time. Um, so th there is sort of that trade-off. And of course, with that, that obviously means uh, not just the education side, but um, education about Lambda and serverless, but, you know, generally, how do I build applications? You know, wh what do I do? And so you did mention the well-architected uh, framework. And so for people who don't know, this is uh, came out in 2015. And in 2017, there was a serverless lens, which was added to it, which is basically serverless specific information for well-architected. And well-architected means, you know, bringing best practices to serverless applications. Uh, you know, if you're building product applications in the cloud, you know, you're normally looking to build and operate them following best practices. And, you know, and this is useful stuff throughout the software lifecycle. It's not just at the end to tick a few boxes and go, yes, we've done uh, done that. So, you know, tip start early with a, with a well-architected journey. It will help you. And to sort of answer the question, you know, am I well-architected? And I mean, that is a bit of a fuzzy, what is that question? But, uh, you right. know, it's the idea is to give you more confidence in the uh, in the architecture and operations mm. of your workloads, and you know that goal that's not a goal in its end, but it's to reduce and minimize the impact of any issues that can happen. And so what we do is we try and distill some of our um, some of our questions and thoughts on how how you could do things, and we build that into the well architected framework. And so the serverless lens has you know a few questions on its operational excellence, uh, security reliability, performance, efficiency, and cost optimization. Excellent. I knew I was going to forget one of them, and I didn't. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, th these are things like, you know, how do you, ac how do you control access to an API? How do you do lifecycle management? Um, you know, how do you build resiliency into your applications? All these kind of things. And so the well-architected uh, framework with a serverless lens is a whole bunch of guidance to help you do that. And I have been slowly writing a blog series to literally cover all of the questions, the nine questions in the well-architected serverless lens. Um, and I'm about halfway through and I had to pause because we we have this little conference called reInvent, which uh, requires one or two slides to be created. And, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that I'm literally, I'm desperately keen to, to pick that up again. Um, and yeah, that's just providing some really, and more sort of more opinionated stuff because the documentation is awesome and it's very in-depth and it's great when you need all the kind of stuff. But sometimes mm. you want to know, well, okay, just tell me what to do or what do you right. think is best rather than these are the seven different you options. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> right. yeah. that's a, I think that's exactly. a common question. Exactly. So, I mean, I, I will, and I'll launch off from that to, you know, uh, to mention, uh, you know, my colleague, James Bezek, who uh, he writes one or two things on serverless. Um, yeah, I mean, every, every once day. in a while you see something <laughs> from it. Yeah. <laughs> the Bez bot machine of serverless. He's amazing. James is so knowledgeable and writes like a machine. He's brilliant. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to be on his team. So when you talk about education, I learn from him. Um, but anyway, in a roundabout way, he's created this um, blog series uh, and other series called uh, the Lambda Operations Guide. And this mm. is literally a whole in-depth study on how to operate Lambda. And it goes into a whole bunch of things. You know, it's sort of linked to the serverless lens because there are a lot of a uh, lot of common kind of stuff. But it's it's also a great read if you are you know more nerdly interested in Lambda than just uh, firing off a function. Just to read through it, it's it's written in an accessible way and it has got a whole bunch of information on how to operate Lambda and some of the stuff under under the scenes how it works. So it's just so you can understand it better. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, you mentioned this idea of uh, confidence too. And I can tell you right now, I've been writing serverless applications. Well, let's see, what year is it? 2021. So I started in 2015, um, you know, writing with or building applications with Lambda. Uh, so I've been doing this for a while and I still get to a point every once in a while where I'm trying to put something in CloudFormation or I'm using the serverless framework or whatever, and you're trying to configure something and you think about, well, wait, how do I want to do this? Or is this the right way to do that? You know, yeah. and you just, you, you have that moment where you're like, well, let me just search and see what other people are doing and there are a lot of myths about serverless there are a lot of um there's as, as much good information as uh, is out there there's a lot of bad information out there yeah. too um and that's something that is is, is kind of hard to combat but i think that um you know I, maybe, maybe we could maybe we could end it there like what are some of the things like if people the questions people are having maybe some of the myths maybe some of the um the the concerns like what what are what are those top ones that you think you could uh sort of you know Dispel. tell people dispel yeah that you could say look these are these these aren't things to worry about and again go and read your blog post series go and read uh james's blog post series um and you're going to get the right answers to these things yeah i mean 
There are misconceptions, and some of them are just historical, where people think that Lambda functions can only run for five minutes. They can run right. for 15 minutes. Uh, Lambda functions can also now run up to 10 gig of RAM. You know, at reInvent, it was only three gig of RAM. So that's a mm. three times increase in Lambda functions within a three times proportional increase in CPU. So I like to say, if you had a, a CPU intensive job that took 40 minutes and you couldn't run it on Lambda, you know, you've now got three times the CPU. Maybe you can run it on Lambda now because because mm. because that would that would work. So yeah, some of those are historical things that have just changed. You know, even I know you know we've got EFS for Lambda. That's some kind of thing. You know, you can't do state with Lambda. You know, uh, EFS and NFS isn't everybody's cup of tea, but uh, you know that's certainly going to help. Uh, going to help some people out. And then the other big one is also cold starts. Right. And this is this is an interesting one because. Um, Obviously, we've done we've sort of solved the cold start issue with connecting uh, lambda functions to VPCs, so that's no longer an issue, and that's been a barrier for you know lo lo lots of people for good reason, and that's now lo no longer the case. Um, but the other thing for cold starts is interesting because um, people do stick still get caught up with cold starts, but particularly for development because they create a lambda function, they right. run it, oh, that's a cold start, and then they update it and they run a thing, oh, that's a cold start, and they don't sort of grok that. The more you run your Lambda function, the less cold starts you have, right. um, just by uh, because they warm starts. And you know, uh, it's literally uh, the number of Lambda functions that are running at exactly the same time will have a cold start. But then every subsequent Lambda function invocation for quite a while will be using right. a warm a warm function. And so you know, as it ramps up, you know, we see you know in the small percentages of cold starts that are that are actually going to happen and uh, you know when we're talking again about the container image support you know that's got a whole bunch of com uh, complexity which people are trying to understand hopefully people are learning from this podcast about that as well but also with the cold starts with that you know those are huge and they they're particular ways that you can construct your lambda functions to really reduce those cold starts and it's best practices anyway um right. but yeah cold starts is also definitely uh, definitely one of those myths and, and just, the other one, just yeah. to one, well, one one note on cold starts too. Just is something that I I find to be interesting. I know that we, I even had spent time battling with that earlier on, especially with VPC cold starts. That's all sort of gone away now. So much more efficient. Um, the other thing is like provision concurrency. Yeah. Um, if you're using provision concurrency to get your cold starts down, I'm not even sure that's the right use for provision concurrency. I think provision concurrency is more just to make sure you have enough capacity because of the ramp up time for lambda. Um, you certainly can use it for cold starts, but I don't think you need to that's yeah, just it, not my two cents on that yeah. no that is true and they, they're two different use cases for the same kind of thing yeah you as you say you know lambda is pretty scalable but there is a, a bit of a ramp up to get up to you know many 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 thousands or tens of thousands of concurrent uh, executions right. and so yeah using provision currency you can uh, get that up in advance and yeah some people do also use it for um uh, for uh for provision concurrency for getting those cold starts done um and yeah that is another very valid use case uh, but that's obviously, you know, it's only an issue for synchronous workloads as well. Anything right. asynchronous, you really shouldn't be caring right. too much, other than Absolutely. for cost perspective, because it's going to take longer to run. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, though, um, I, I have a feeling that the last one you were going to mention, because um, uh, this one bugs me quite a bit, is this idea of no ops, or some people call it opsless, um, which yeah. I think is kind of funny. Um, but uh, that that's one of those things where, oh, it drives me nuts when I hear this. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, and it's a frustrating thing. And I think often, sometimes when people are talking about no ops, they either have something to sell you, and sometimes what they're selling you is getting rid of something, which you know never is the case. It's not as though we develop serverless applications and we we don't we we can then you know get rid of half of our development team. You know, it just does right. it doesn't work like that, and it's crazy, in fact. And uh, when I was talking about the people aspect of IT, you know, this is a super important thing, and me coming from an, uh, an infrastructure background, you know, everybody is dying in their jobs to do more meaningful work and to do right. more interesting things and have the agility to, you know, try those experiments or try something else or, you know, <clears throat> do something that's better or even, uh, you know, uh, improve the way you are built or improve the way, you know, your CICD pipeline runs or anything rather than just having to do a, a lot of work in the lower levels. And this is what serverless really helps you do is to be able to We'll take over a whole lot of the ops for you, but it's not all of the ops because right. there, it, in a way there's never an end to ops right. um, because you can always do stuff better. And it's not just the operations of deploying Lambda functions and limits and all that kind of thing. But I mean, think think of observability and 
not knowing just about your application, but knowing about your business. Think of think of if you had the time that you weren't just you know monitoring function invocations and monitoring how long things were happening. But imagine if you were able to pull together dashboards of exactly what each transaction costs as it flows through your mm-hmm. whole entire application. Think of the benefit of that to your business, or think right. of the benefit that in real time, you know, even if it's on Lambda function usage or something, you can say, well, oh, there's an immediate drop or or pick up in one region in the world or one particular application. And you can spot that immediately. You know, that kind of stuff, you just haven't had time to play with to actually build. But right. if we can take over some of the operational stuff with you and, and run, you know, one or two or trillions of Lambda functions in the background just to keep this all ticking along nicely, you are always going to have an opportunity to do more ops. But I think the exciting bit is that ops is not just IT infrastructure plumbing ops, but you can start even doing even better business ops where you can have more right. business visibility and more cool stuff for your business because we're not writing apps just for funsies. Right, right. And I think that's that's probably a good uh, maybe a good a good way to describe serverless. It allows you to focus on more meaningful work uh, and more meaningful tasks, maybe or more maybe not more meaningful but more impactful. Um, you yeah. know, on the on the on the business. Um, anyways, uh, Julian, listen, this was a great conversation. I appreciate it. I appreciate the work that you're doing um, over at AWS and the Thank and you. the stuff that you're uh, uh, that you're doing. And I I hope um, that there will be a conference soon that um, we will be able to uh, attend uh, together. <laughs> um, oh, maybe grab so a drink. Too. So um, if people <laughs> want to get a hold of you um, uh, or find out more about uh, you know serverless and what AWS is doing with that how do they do that yeah absolutely well please uh, get uh, hold of me anytime on Twitter is the easiest way probably Julian underscore wood uh, happy to answer your question about anything uh, serverless or lambda and if I don't know the answer I'll always ask Jeremy so you covered <laughs> twice over there and then um, uh, Three different things. Uh, James's, if we're talking specifically Lambda, James Bizzik's uh, operations guide. Have a look at that. Um, just so much uh, nuggets of super in- information. We've got another thing. We did just sort of jump around. You were talking about cloud formation, and the spark was going off in my head. We have something which we're calling the serverless patterns collection, and this is mm, really right. super cool. We didn't quite get to talk about it, but if you're building um, applications using uh, SAM, our serverless application model, or using the CDK, so either way, we've got a whole bunch of uh, patterns which you can grab. So if you're you know, putting something from S3 to Lambda or from Lambda to EventBridge or SNS to SQS with a filter, or all these kind of, uh, kind of things, they are literally copy and paste um, patterns that you can put immediately into your CloudFormation or your CDK templates. So when you're uh, you down the rabbit hole of uh, Hacker News or Reddit or Stack Overflow, this is another resource that you can use to right. copy and paste. So go for that. And that's all hosted on our, our cool site called serverlessland.com. So that's serverlessland.com. And that's an aggregation site that we run because we've got video talks and we've got um, blog right. posts and we've got learning path series and we've got a you know a whole bunch of stuff. I, personally, I've got a learning path series coming out shortly on Lambda extensions and also one on Lambda observability. There's one coming out shortly on container image support. And you know, and our team is talking all over as many things as we can virtually. I'm actually speaking about container images at DockerCon, which is coming up, which is a, which is exciting. Um, and yes, yeah, so serverlessland.com. That's got a whole bunch of information that that's just an easy one-stop shop where you can get um, in, as much information about AWS serverless as you can and if not yet yeah, get in touch I'm uh, happy to help I'm happy to also carry your feedback and um, yeah at the, at the moment just a uh, inside we're sort of doing the doing our planning for the next uh, cycle of what lambda and what all the server stuff are going to do so if you've got your if you've got an awesome idea please uh, please send it on and I'm sure you'll be super excited when something pops out in the nearish or maybe distant future for a cool new functionality you could have been involved in. <laughs> um, well, I know that um, uh, serverlessland.com is an excellent resource. And uh, it's not that the AWS Compute blog is hard to parse through or anything, but serverlessland.com yes. is, is certainly a much easier resource to get there. So um, awesome. Julian, I will get all that stuff in the show notes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, one more thing I didn't mention is serverless oh, sure. office hours um, every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm in London at 6 p.m. So serverless office hours for an hour every week. We rotate about five different topics and bring any of your questions, uh, you know, anything. It's not just Lambda, step functions, API gateway, messaging, Lambda, serverless surprise as well. So yeah, have any questions, uh, join us. And that's, uh, the links are also on serverless land and it's on, on Twitch and YouTube. Um, so yeah, that's another way you can get in touch. And yeah, just to finish with James, um, Jeremy, thank you so much for inviting me. You've been a light in the serverless world and we really, really appreciate internally at AWS and personally about how you 
you've uh, you know created and talked about community and people and just made the service thing such a cool place to be so yeah thank you for all you've done and i really appreciate being able to share a little bit of time with you well thank you it was great And that's this week's serverless chat. I want to give a huge thank you to Julian Wood for being my guest this week and to our sponsors, CBT Nuggets and Lumigo. If you want to check out the show notes and a full transcript of this episode, you can find them at serverlesschat.com slash 101. For more serverless chats, subscribe, sign up to be an insider, check us out on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can connect with me on Twitter at Jeremy underscore daily. And if you want to keep up to date on everything serverless, make sure you subscribe to the Off by None newsletter at offbynone.io. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to chatting with all of you again next week.